welcome uh, this evening for a CBRL webinar um, on understanding the development of complex societies in Lebanon during the early Bronze Age. Uh, my name is uh, Carol Palmer. I am director of CBRL in Amman, Jordan. And thank you very much all for joining us uh, for this CBRL webinar this evening. Um, coming to you with colleagues from the University of Durham in the UK. Um, Dr. Kamal Badrashani will be giving the lecture and um, the session will be chaired by and introduced by Professor Graham Phillip, also from, from Durham. Uh, my role is to welcome you all um, here to tonight to this evening's lecture. Um, hope you're all keeping safe and well wherever you are. And to give you a, a short introduction for those who may not be familiar with our organization, the Council for British Research in the Levant, CBRL, a short introduction. Also, as more people are coming into the Zoom room. So, CBRL is an independent UK research charity and membership organization that exists to conduct, support and promote humanities and social science research um, on the Levant or Levantine Middle East. We're one of the British Academy affiliated British International Research Institutes, also called BIRI. And, and through the British Academy, we receive a grant in aid to support our operations, but we are always grateful to our members and friends who support us in kind or through donations and also become members. We have a loyal membership group. Um, we have an office in London at the British Academy with fellow Biris and two institutes in the region. I'm speaking you today, as I said, from our institute in Amman, Jordan. Um, we hope that you will enjoy today's webinar and that you will join us for future events, either online or hopefully in the future in person. Please do take a look at our website, uh, cbrl.ac.uk for information on future and upcoming events. And you can also if you're not already on our mailing list, join our mailing list too. My role now is to introduce Professor Graham Phillip, um, who is a professor at uh, Durham University, also previously worked as um, assistant director um, several years ago at, our, at the British Institute at Amman for Archaeology and History, which is our name before we became CBRL in Amman. He has been at the University of Durham since 1994, and his research interests fall in three main areas, landscape archaeology, artifact studies, and the nature of early complex societies. Uh, Professor Philip is currently a co-investigator on the Heritage Project, um, Protection Project, Endangered Archaeology in the Middle East and North Africa, working with project partners in Lebanon, Iraq, and the Caucasus. And he also in Jordan co-directs uh, with colleagues at Yarmouk University here, a project uh, to create an environmental isoscape map of Jordan, which is part of the, the Newton uh, Fund program. And for CBRL, until recently, until December, he was editor in chief of CBRL's journal, Levant. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Professor Philip now to introduce our speaker and be chair for the presentation today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Kamal Badrashani, who will be talking about the development of complex societies in Lebanon during the early Bronze Age. Um, uh, Dr. Badrashani is originally from Chicago, part of that large uh, American Lebanese community, and did an MA at uh, the American University of Beirut, and then subsequently a PhD on Chicago uh, at Chicago, uh, focusing particularly on ceramics and uh, ceramic petrography. Um, he's published extensively on um, 
pottery, particularly from the Levant on Phoenician amphorae, coneware jars, uh, EB4 Syrian goblets, black wheel made ware, and has excavated at a number of sites in Lebanon, including Tel Burak, uh, uh, Tel Fadus, and is currently co-director with myself and uh, Professor Elaine Sada from AUB at the excavations at Tel Kuba in northern Lebanon. So you haven't really come to hear me talk, you've come to hear Dr. Badrashani. So with that, I'll hand you over. Okay, thank you, Graham, for that introduction. And thank you for um, uh, agreeing to act as chair. Thank you to Max and thank you to Carol for organizing the event. Uh, event. And thank you to all of you for braving the dangers of the internet uh, to be here today. To hear me talk about a topic I've been um, working on or at least thinking about the better part of uh, part of my career. Um, today, we hope to sort of rethink um, our understanding a little bit uh, about how complex societies and urbanism um, developed in the Levant. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be focusing on Lebanon, and I don't think the data from Lebanon will be enough to, you know, create a complete paradigm shift in the way we think about urbanism um, in the Levant. However, I hope that this unique data set, this, this unique pathway will um, let us question perhaps some of our core assumptions and beliefs um, about the process. And anyway, I just wanna stress that, you know, I think urbanism is a package of, of various different pathways um, and various different conditions. And I hope that what we gain from this presentation is um, an understanding that even within the Levant itself, there are many um, ways to, to achieve that process. So before we start talking about um, you know trajectories and and you know you know we should really decide or define what an early Bronze Age city actually is. So the first dense agglomerations and you know you'll see me sort of moving away from the word city um, incrementally as we as we continue on with this presentation. Um, it emerges around they emerge around 3050 BC, pretty much across the central and uh, southern um, Levant. Now the question about how and why these um, agglomerations occur has been one that's vexed archaeologists for a very long time. And I would say that, you know, in many ways, we're good at describing, you know, the physical elements that represent this, its manifestations. Now, that's usually thrown about as an insult in archaeology, you know, it's very descriptive, but, you know, I mean that quite sincerely. You know, we know a lot about, thanks to a lot of good work that's been undertaken, um, you know, further to the south and in Lebanon and all across the Levant, about what occurs when in very specific details. Um, so we know a, a specifics about certain types of building phases and such. However, I would say that um, our understanding of what actually goes on in these places um, perhaps maybe isn't as developed as it could be, or a lot of what goes on is, is assumed. So we don't have as good an understanding perhaps of civic life, uh, especially um, in terms of Lebanon and what it means to be from one of these cities. So, Key elements of identity uh, and the ritual, economic, and political hierarchies, I would argue, should be re examined a bit in light of new data. I mean, I think the key thing is, you know, within the Levant and across the Near East, um, there are, you know, sort of key elements of shared infrastructure. For example, you know, you can see the fortification wall at, at the site of Biblos here in Lebanon um, and the types of buildings that occur. I mean, they sort of occur everywhere. And this might imply also a sort of um, sociological unity. Um, and also, you know, a unity with perhaps later notions of civic life because, you know, city walls and public spaces and, you know, market squares are things that we also, you know, find in later medieval cities. But we have to ask ourselves, can we impose those notions of civic life on earlier um, societies? And in this particular context, you know, our terms, you know, in speaking specifically now about Lebanon, are terms like urbanism and city even useful or are they too vague to be useful? So I thought I'd take us through what, you know, some have considered the key elements of this, um, this process and decide whether or not we have good evidence for them occurring. So of course we have good evidence of settlement hierarchies all throughout the Levant, big sites and smaller sites. The settlements almost, um, you know, are very dense. Um, they're planned, and they have what I would consider to be civic infrastructure. So again, you know, looking at the, the big, um, the big wall here. Um, though I would say that the sizes vary drastically. 
and I'll get to that point a little bit later. On um, the sizes of the settlements, cities we you know we think of them as economic hubs, and is there evidence that these cities actually function? Um, again, speaking uh, you know specifically about the Lebanese context as economic hubs, um, we have limited evidence of markets, or in fact, market economy, um, or you know the craft production taking place at these sites. And we have a lot of evidence of an increase in craft production. However, the location isn't necessarily associated with um, the core site. Of course, further to the south, you have some evidence of this, but still it's, it's not what I would call um, widespread. Um, there is of course some evidence of um, these places as hubs of agricultural processing and storage. Um, so there's an economic activity. And I would argue that for this period, um, international connections are quite limited, though much is made out of some connections with this particular site, Biblos in Egypt. Um, I'll address that a bit later. What about the city as a political hub? You know, um, I would say there's no evidence of extreme or significant social differentiation or manifestations of, of kingship. And that's pretty much about why, though, as we move on in the period, um, those, you know, those differentiations can be seen in the EB3, um, especially further to the south. And do we have, you know, um, evidence of uh, ritual performance or communal activity? And of course, yes, um, we do have that. And again, you know, the, the city wall is staring you in the face. That's a, that's a huge communal activity. Um, we have uh, things that are identified as temples, though interestingly, cultic objects are not as common as you would, um, as you would think. So, Bearing that in mind, how do these spaces align with our notions of what we would consider civic life? But what's it like, you know, to be from Biblos? How do you identify when, if you live there in the early Bronze Age? And what's the wider social and geographical context? And has the imposition of these concepts, you know, sort of hindered our understanding of what's actually going on in these places? Hopefully questions for a vibrant discussion later. <clears throat> So the key question we're all after is how and why does this administrative complexity develop in the Levantine context? Now, I think, you know, we would tend to see it um, as a long-term process of social and technological uh, innovation, uh, which eventually, you know, leads over a you know, thousand years or something to population growth and the need for administrative complexity. And, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of evidence for that. Um, if you move um, further to the south, there's a very clear, you know, calculific, EB1A and the EB1B, where you can see this process um, playing out. Um, however, you know, the EB2, and I think we're all in agreement on this, um, sort of arrives, or the, the main um, the thrust of urban society arrives quite suddenly on the Lebanese coast. It kind of seems to come a bit out of nowhere with no connection to what preceded it, really. So, in a sense, this argues in this particular um, context against a long term developmental process. Um, we don't know much about the Bika. Uh, honestly, I studied that material for my dissertation, but um, you know, it does seem there are indications that it develops a bit more like areas further um, to the south. So um, the social conditions underpinning settlement nucleation are variable, I think, and can only be understood as such because you know, we have key differences even within the Levant itself. And therefore, I think when we, though the infrastructure looks pretty similar, there's no one size fits all explanation really possible for understanding the development of urbanism in the Levant. So what makes Lebanon so different? Um, you know, I mean, it's particularly mountainous, you know, a lot of parts of the Levant are, but, and it's very well forested and well watered. And, you know, I'm obviously just showing these pictures because um, I miss being there and it's a beautiful place. Um, but like the rest of the Levant, uh, there are multiple strategies for subsistence possible. Um, but perhaps you could see, you know, the northern part of Lebanon, especially um, as even more so um, providing those opportunities and even climatologically more stable. I draw your attention here to this little homestead. And I think, you know, we, we can think of this in terms of the early Bronze Age. It's just, you know, find yourself a sunny spot on a mountain and, you know, with a little bit of land and just go ahead and make a life for yourself. And I mean, it's quite a romantic idea and one that um, appeals to me um, quite a bit. However, there is great variation across the country as there is in the rest of the Levant. And, you know, parts of the Bika um, that, you know, are behind the mountains in these areas are, are quite dry, you know, and, and you can almost see them as deserts, you know, we're seeing very small amounts of rainfall. So again, you know, there's, there's not going to be one, you know, one size fits all explanation uh, within Lebanon itself either. In some ways, um, we can see similar developmental phases um, 
with the EB2 and 3 in Palestine, though the key thing is that the EB1B, okay, this main phase that, that occurs before urbanism gets going, seems to be missing in Lebanon. We haven't found it yet, and I have to say on the coast, I don't think we are necessarily going to. There's a great expansion of settlement. Now, these are some of the principal sites um, that we know, though I have colleagues, uh, Jenny Bradbury, Bryn Mawr, um, in, in Herman Gens, uh, Karen Kapetsky, May Heider and Marco Yomi, and they're all um, engaged in surveys and they're finding scatters of early Bronze Age sites. So we know that um, settlement is widespread on the coast and in the mountains, but we don't understand the character of most of those um, settlement in most of those places. The other thing I can say about Lebanon and the sites that occur there is they're relatively small. Okay, so the largest sites are four to five hectares or so. Those are the principal ones like Biblos. Um, maybe the ones like Saida and Entire might be a little bit bigger. But a lot of the sites we have excavated are you know, one or two hectares. And you know, here's the site of Tel Farus in its original extent. And here is just a, an image of Farus superimposed on the street where I live. And, and I'm talking to you here from here now, but just to show you how tiny it is as a place. And you know, in fact, you, you, know, you really think you could, if you needed to get someone's attention, you could basically get it from anywhere um, within the site. So the question is in a place that small, and even in a place four or five hectares or so, I mean, if we're talking about a population of 100 persons per hectare. Some people would use higher figures, but I'd say given the um, architectural layouts is, is reasonable. I mean, we're talking about 100 people, maybe 300 people living in a place like Biblos, 400. Um, so, you know, you have to think, um, you know, what kind of civic life is possible? You know, is there any anonymity there? And in fact, you know, is, um, is organization really necessary? You know, anthropologists um, may, what might say not. You know, the city, the society is small scale enough, you know, to not necessarily need um, representation. <clears throat> However, I do think, you know, we're seeing just the tip of the iceberg here because of the massive nature of the building projects, there must be people that are not represented or not living in cities themselves. Compare that with, and this is taken from uh, Demir Shedji, 2018, um, average sizes in Palestine, <clears throat> where, you know, a lot of the smallest sizes in that rate, smallest sites are about four hectares. And you know, most of them are much larger. And in fact, some are much bigger, um, you know, 20 or 30 um, hectares, talking about Tel Aviv era. Coming back to Lebanon, um, the level of knowledge is varied. Um, the settlement landscape of the Bekaa is well known because it's a flat plain, you can easily survey it. Um, whereas, you know, my colleagues I mentioned earlier will tell you it's an absolute slog um, serving on the Lebanese coast, but uh, excavation is almost non-existent and especially EV excavation. So we will, um, we will focus on a cluster of settlements on the coast. Um, here you can, you can see it here, um, the sites of Biblos, so Farus, Kfar Abida, and Kurta II, <clears throat> and draw in relevant uh, information from Sidon and Tel Arco, which are well excavated sites and have provide us with a wealth of data that help us re-examine some, uh, some of the older data and contextualize it. So um, the EB2, Three developments in Lebanon are broadly in line in terms of physical infrastructure, material culture, uh, with this core zone of distinctive pottery. Some people call it metallic ware, broadly speaking, combed ware. I mean, it, it really, its core zone is probably in this area here, sort of northern Palestine and, and Lebanon. And you know, we can see some some clear relationships there, though there are some peculiarities and some differences um, in the development tr developmental trajectories in the ceramic material and in the architecture. Um, some little things, um, you know, for example, um, here is this, uh, this hall from, from Farouz Kfarabida and in Lebanon, for some reason on the coast at least, they love, you know, putting column bases um, in corners. And while column halls exist throughout the Levant, they, they usually don't have the bases in the corners as far as I know. And you can see what this would have looked like. Um, sorry, the assumption there is it, it um, held up a second story. The entrance was from, from the top. This is a mud brick house from the, from the site of Tel Arca, uh, which you just saw on the map a little bit ago. Now the Biblos region tends to really like to build in stone. You know, don't mind the, the castle in the background, that's medieval, but you can still see, I mean, these walls are quite impressive. You know, and do keep an eye on these buttress walls they are going to make um, an appearance again later. But there's a lot of building in stone there. Whereas, you know, our evidence from Sidon and from Tel Arca shows that, you know, there's stone foundations, but generally they're building in big mud brick. So I've drawn together um, this map of, phases. And it's, you know, I have to say this is really tentative because we, um, for various reasons, it's quite difficult to get the dating quite right, um, or at least certain aspects of it. Um, <clears throat> but just to say that we have four architectural phases that I would say that are, that seem to be evident um, at a lot of these, um, at a lot of the sites in the Biblos region anyway. 
um, you know, Biblos, um, and, and especially at Farus. And, um, and just to say that these, these sites do seem to be linked. So it, it's like when, you know, when there's building at one, it seems like things happen at the other. So it does, does seem to show that they're, they're kind of linked. So um, <clears throat> the, our first evidence is for the calcolithic ED. And this one is um, very difficult to track. I mean, we don't really know when it occurs. It's mostly represented by burials, Biblos being the key site, though there's evidence at a site in the south called Sidon Dackerman. Um, and there's evidence um, also at Farouz. And the two radiocarbon dates we have from this period fall within this kind of range. So I suppose, and, and then add to that, that str stratigraphic gaps are recorded by most of the excavators. So it's unclear, but we have to accept the possibility that perhaps um, 3100 BC, you know, something like that, these sites are not necessarily massive foci of settlement. Um, there is some evidence from Biblos, but anyway, we, we just have to understand that these sites aren't, aren't hugely occupied, okay? And then come 3050 BC, you know, we do see some occupation um, at places like Arca and Biblos, and also at the site of Kuba One, um, but we don't really um, have a settlement here. Um, we have small scale building. I'll talk about each of these phases in turn, um, but really the building starts to take off in this EB2, EB3 phase, which is really hard to pin down um, actually. And just to note this, um, this seal impressions uh, here will, will become, this jar is from Arca, it's a beautiful jar. Um, I suppose I just wanted to show it for that reason, but uh, they will become an important chronological marker for us uh, in this period here. Now, the EB3, we have a huge, just like all throughout um, you know, Palestine and in the central Levant, we have a huge influx of um, or a massive building program at all sites uh, with huge fortifications. The problem is it's quite difficult to date anything after about 2800 BC because we have this sort of terrible shelf in the radiocarbon data. Now, if you have a site with lots of radiocarbon dates and they do some fancy statistics, they can sort of start to parse this out. Um, but we, so we have to be a bit cautious about this date, but most of the activity seems to be taking place between 2700 and 2650 or 2500 BC. Um, luckily they've done this work at Farus and they, you know, they have a clear indication of when these phases start. Okay, another key point is um, during the Calcolithic, all of the early Bronze Age sites so, show some evidence of occupation um, during, during the early Bronze Age, they show some evidence of occupation um, in the Calcolithic. Um, so this is a key thing. So where we have, except one exception I can think of, a big EB site, there's some evidence that it was at least the focus of attention um, in the Calcolithic. So the key point to make here is that the location of sites is generally independent of concerns of this new um, urban system that comes in. I mean, these sites were chosen beforehand. Um, so before we start asking, you know, why Kuba isn't located near a port or something like that, I mean, it, the possibility definitely exists that um, it was it was cited there for a reason that that um, that's the continuation of something that's much earlier and much ancient. The location of sites is often next to unique features. I mean, this might be a bit of subjectivity on my part, I'll admit. However, um, knowing the Lebanese coast really well, I often think that. Um, so there might be some sort of symbolic associations with the earlier Trisky settlements. So what I mean by this is, you know, uh, Kuba itself, Kuba II sits on a spur, it's a lovely picture of it, um, but it's an odd thing on, in the coastal context, that's for sure. And likewise, people who know Kuba know the caves that sit just behind the site. And again, it's not something you find um, that commonly. It really is a unique feature on the coast. But Usk Farabida um, has its really strange underwater springs. You know, when you're swimming in the sea there, they sort of jet at you um, and they're very, uh, feels quite nice actually. Um, and then, you know, the site of Enfir, which is a newly discovered early Bronze Age site, sits on you know, this, this strange rocky outcrop, which anyone in Lebanon would know is associated with Enfir. So um, our story begins at the site of Biblos. It's um, a well-known disaster in terms of excavations, I would say, and everyone knows that it was excavated in, in quite a, who's an archeologist of the region knows it was excavated in quite a terrible way. Um, a colleague of mine, Michelle de Vries, has been um, focused on this um, site of, of recent. And, you know, discussions with him have, have led me to sort of rethink. I sort of wrote this site off, honestly, um, when I was about 25, 26, because the strate stratigraphy is so confused, you can never really be sure of anything. But given what's, given the data that we have from places like Farouz and places like Arca and, you know, emerging data sets at Sidon and Kuba, um, we now can reassess this data. And Michelle has made some interesting observations, which has you know, sort of changed my, um, 
my uh, my mind about this site. And in fact, some of the information I'll be presenting here, you know, actually a good deal of it are, are ideas that he first came up with. So I want to give him credit there. Um, the um, starting with the calcolithic EB, uh, the main evidence here um, are burials, and Biblos is really um, the key site. There are dwellings, but their relationship to the site is unclear. And each one of these little gray dots represents a burial. And just to say, uh, I was talking earlier about symbolic features. Um, you know, Biblos has a sacred spring um, at its heart, two hills and a sacred spring. So, so you know, the, it seems to be a focal point of activity. And the burials are interesting. They, you know, they contain. Um, um, quite a lot of exotic grave goods. Um, you know, there's a mace head here, there's metal objects, gold, silver, I mean, not in high proportions, but they exist. Um, you know, it shows um, good linkages um, with other areas in Anatolia, Anatolia and possibly Egypt. Now, the interesting thing is that this tends to be absent from EB1 Palestine, and uh, Rafi Greenberg in his, in his latest book, you know, posited the idea that, you know, Uruk as it's expanding in Mesopotamia, has kind of sucked away, closed the trade routes or sucked away attention from Palestine. So at the same time, um, we don't see those linkages anymore. So Biblos is quite unique. And I would argue it's more in the spirit of the um, ritual economies that were common in the Calcolithic, where you know you work really hard to acquire items that you then take out of circulation, you know, to sort of almost throw away. Okay, um, here is a, a map of the, the site of Biblos in the EB2. Um, we don't know much. Um, we know that the principal sites are occupied, as I mentioned earlier, Arca and Biblos. Um, we have Kuba One here. Here you can see where the settlement in here is, but but the occupation is basically um, limited to pits that are cut into earlier Neolithic layers. So we have this very early material, which is useful because it helps us in creating this kind of um, this understanding of the chronology. Um, but you know, there's not really a settlement. I don't think one is ever going to uh, to emerge, unfortunately. We have limited building, and, and just to say our appreciation of this period is, um, you know, in EV3, they really build these crazy buildings with deep foundations. So I think a lot of what, um, what occurs um, is, uh, is decimated. But, you know, you'll notice we have no um, fortification wall. So while this idea of urbanism arrives quite suddenly, you know, it probably, there's some evidence that it progresses quite slowly um, until about 2800 BC, um, or 2900 BC, rather. Um, in this EB23 transition, um, there's a major expansion of settlement. Kuba 1 moves over here to this, um, this site, Kuba 2, uh, to the site of Kuba 2. Um, you know, we, you know, Fradus is now occupied. All the sites are occupied that I mentioned earlier. Um, we only have, again, few walls here, and that's because this later period that kind of decimates them, but there's a clear um, occupation there. Um, there's a change in the pottery technology. Um, that allows us to cautiously date this phase. I'll talk about it in a little bit, but with the EB2, they use this very distinct pottery that's made of shale, and it's nothing like it existed before. It's a complete break with anything um, that existed before. And then they stop using it, you know, around, um, except in limited cases, um, after about 2700 BC, maybe even a little bit earlier. So, and nothing like it occurs after, you know. So, um, because of a specific fabric of this, a specific way it's being made, um, we think that it belongs solely to the EB23 transition and it's used for a lot of the specialized wear, but I'll talk about that um, toward the end of the presentation. Just one second. So, talking about the EB3, um, remember there are two phases. Um, the EB3 phase A is represented by these gray buildings here, uh, darker gray rather, and then the, the next phase um, is represented by um, the opening of the building plan here, phase four. Um, it's major building works. You know, this at Biblos was called the era of the large foundations. So these had these huge buildings. I mean, you can't you can't see this, but you know, this wall is, I mean, here it's a meter and a half high and you know, maybe two meters on the other side. It's massive. And the site, despite it being a hectare, you know, or a hectare and a half, has a massive thick meter, six meter thick fortification, which is much more than anyone of the period would need. You know, most people who are engaged in um, uh, uh, warf you know, uh, engaged in studying warfare in the region would agree that this is just beyond what anyone could even breach. You know, on a, so, so even this tiny site is well planned and well fortified in line with all other sites um, you know, that we know of this period um, or many of the other sites we know of this period um, Levant wide. And the excavator, uh, Herman Gens, sorry about this, um, interpreted most of the buildings um, at the site 
um, you know, as having some sort of specialized uh, administrative um, function in both spaces, really, except for building one, which um, I had the great pleasure of excavating um, uh, this room under the guidance of, of Herman Gens. So there would be no reason, you know, which he thought was a domestic context. Um, you know, you would have no reason to question this. There's an oven in the corner here. Uh, there's this mortar for grinding things. And, you know, you have this sort of um, bones like this strewn all over, over the area. There's a big cooking pot smashed up. Um, though I do look at this, you know, and start to wonder um, about the nature and the, the nature of this kind of meal. So, you know, Herman once said in the paper, you know, that he thought, uh, you know, it was the last meal of the people who lived there and then they, they sort of moved on. And I did wonder if this was perhaps, I mean, if we found this in the context that it was a temple, we might interpret it differently and say it's, you know, the remains of a feast. But these buildings are all filled in, you know, um, and then the later phase is built. So I did wonder if this was partially some sort of, I very cautiously say it, um, a sort of ritual um, meal that then, you know, can sort of desanctify the building or something like that. But anyway, uh, just, uh, just a thought. And while we're here in the EB3, phase A, um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go over to Kuba. Um, here shows you the main thrust of the site. This area here, um, by the time we got to the site in 2015, was um, destroyed and a number of buildings built there. So the top is completely um, destroyed. What would have been the heart of the settlement? Um, I don't show you any pictures because quite frankly, it's heartbreaking. So we're limited to working on this side of the tell. Um, and just to say there are some evidence of structures um, down here and, and we excavated down here in a very limited way and, and did find some evidence. So um, geophysics is showing that and we hope to, we hope to go in you know, 2020, but that obviously um, we'll have to postpone that for, for a year. So we hope to go in September. But anyway, most of our excavation um, is taking place um, here. And what we found um, sorry, the cursor here is this this huge, you know, 19 meter straight wall um, that is buttressed in similar in the way that I that I showed you earlier. Um, and you know, the edges here are are marked with um, with Asher blocks, which is also a common way to mark corners um, during this phase of the EB3. Um, the buttresses are very important, you know, because the, you know, in, in Michelle. Michelle again was the, was the main excavator here, Michelle DeVries, and he pointed it out immediately. He said, look, you know, at Biblos, we have, you know, three, three examples of this where essentially the buttresses only go around either public architecture, here you have it, the city wall uh, are always buttresses, or, you know, sacred enclosures um, associated with temples. And this is the so-called L-shaped um, temple at Biblos. So you can see the buttressing um, here. And we think on that basis of that evidence that it marks a kind of um, a sacred um, enclosure. Now, what it's enclosing, we, we don't know. Um, there may well be a building back there yet, but we are running out of room because you know you, you come up against a very sheer um, rocky outcrop. Um, and you know it may just be that the rocky outcrop was the place of a, a spring, or you know there might have been a, a waterfall. The area is covered with springs, so that's not implausible. That is, you know, then this thing has since um, dried up, or there may be a building yet. I mean, we have some ways to go. Um, towards a fig tree, basically, <laughs> that, that marks the end of where this wall could possibly be preserved because the site, as I say, um, is heavily damaged. And uh, here we have these, uh, these two rocks. Incorporating natural features is, um, is not uncommon. Uh, we have evidence of it uh, at Biblos. But you know, the, this area here was chock full of you know, broken but nearly complete ceramics, bones. I mean, it's really quite hard to excavate this. Now, I'm not sure whether this was deposited as part of the function of this building or whether you know, people have just been heaving stuff off the top after after the period of this building's use. Um, in the latest phase, you know, moving a little earlier, and I, I have to say, um, honestly, I'm very uncertain of this date because of this this issue I've um, uh, um, uh, discussed with the radiocarbon calibration curve. However, you know, we have a fourth phase like at other other places. So um, just take this bit with a grain of salt. Um, here is the wall I was just showing you, the big massive wall, and they fill it in. I can just go back and show you the entrance here. This is, um, it's been filled in. Um, and then they build these kind of structures here, um, which semicircular structures, which we don't understand. Uh, there are channels connecting them to this room. And in this room, we found these four huge vats. In fact, a, a fifth vat you know, was, was found here. Um, and here you go. And you can see our, our friend Hashim, who reconstructed this very kindly for us, standing next to the vat. And you know, I need to make clear, Hashim is not a small guy. You know, he's like 6'2". So these things are huge. And there are five of them. So this goes beyond you know, what we would need for any sort of domestic or household context. Um, 
we don't know what these vats are used for, but a lot of people think they're used um, with uh, somehow in the olive production of olive oil. Uh, we're having them tested now by residue analysis, so we hope to confirm that. Now, I have seen a method of making olive oil where the, uh, the olives are crushed and then they're, they're put into a large vat and the vat is filled with hot water and you know the, the olive oil is skimmed off. I mean, not a great way to get olive oil, I suppose, maybe not the tastiest, but it, it, you know, we could see these vats used as a settling basin um, in that way. Now, going back to Farouz, um, again, we have a lot more evidence of, you know, this context is completely built over with much larger buildings. You know, it's a common theme also at Biblos that the building plans um, are opened up in a sort of later phase and the, the you know, there are more sort of open plan um, you know, <laughs> buildings. And, um, and uh, we found a lot of evidence of, you know, not many, much evidence according to the excavator of domestic um, activity. But, you know, we found things like these cylinder seals. Um, and then, you know, for example, this one is, is half finished. Um, so, I mean, it kind of shows it's being made there and shows that these buildings have some sort of role um, in, in the administrative um, context. And here I come um, to the plan of Eblos. Um, I'm doing my best to show this, this one here. It, it may or may not be necessarily all to the phase that I think it is. I have to say, I really struggle to get my head around what's going on here. And that's not solely my fault. Um, the, the excavators themselves, I think, were very confused. Um, however, um, you can see again, you know, these sort of larger open plan buildings. And I've circled here um, four temples, things that we clearly identify as temples that existed in this phase. Just to say we know it's EB3 because it has a huge fortification wall. And if it was before that, it would be out of step with, let's say, a lot of uh, parts of the Levant. Um, here is the Balat uh, Gebal um, temple. The excavator came up with interesting names for all of these. And here is the sort of um, sacred enclosure, another temple. And here is what would become the L-shaped temple. You can see the buttresses. And here is the um, temple called the Offering Fields. Um, I, however, I think Lefray, who was the architect here, not the excavator, saw that the you know, settlement was largely organized um, in, in orientation to its sacred well, which is, which is somewhere here. Um, and, you know, and then that these temples were divided by streets, which sort of divided them into almost precincts or quarters. And again, in discussions with, you know, Michelle de Vries has put forward the idea that perhaps at each of these courts, I mean, you can kind of almost see the buildings emanating from each, each temple. So surely some of these buildings were, were associated with the temples. So, I mean, and the other point to make here is that this is kind of the entire site. I mean, he's excavated most of it really. There's not anything missing here, you know, very few areas. So, I mean, the site is largely temple you know, or, or buildings associated with temples. Um, and again, it's divided into quarters. And, you know, Michelle put forth the idea that each of these temple quarters may represent an underlying socio-cultural um, context. You know, perhaps each tribe has a temple in particular, or, you know, they sort of, um, various temples serve various sectors of the community. Um, just to say, we'll see this one come up, the Balak Gebel Temple, because it is definitely a, a focus of uh, Egyptian um, activity. And it's the principal temple of the site. Um, as many people would, would agree. So after 2500 BC, most of the sites that we know are abandoned or their size is reduced or you know, the major architecture is gone, but we've got some indication of some limited settlement there. Um, Biblos continues on, but um, the, the combware jars, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second, which really underpin this entire system. Sorry, I'm doing it in reverse order, but um, you'll hear about them soon. They, um, <clears throat> they disappear from everywhere. Um, except for Talarka in the north and the Syrian coast. Um, and the pottery is likely, you know, no longer produced there. You know, the pottery that we do see in EB4, uh, the limited samples that I've seen represent a complete, you know, um, design and technological break from what was, um, what was being produced there. Save obviously Arco, which really continues on this tradition. <clears throat> I mean, this has been interpreted as the filling of an ideological hole left by the collapse of EB3 structures, you know, um, across Lebanon and across um, Palestine at this time, and a reorientation towards um, towards uh, bigger cities in Syria. What about the economy? Um, you know, the principal thing is that the area and the sites in the area are known for high levels of olive production. Um, there's some evidence for grape and also emmer wheat. Um, and we're talking specifically about the Biblos region here, and you can see this is the paleobotanical breakdown. Um, Excuse me. 
Tel Farouz Kfar Abida in, in, compared with Tel Yarmut uh, in the southern Levant, I mean, they have large proportions of olive. And if you work there and you work at places like Kupa, you know, you can pick up olive stones, you know, all over the site just with your trowel. And they're everywhere. You know, so clearly olive production is a huge part of what this, this site does. Um, emmer wheat is also important. And, you know, we found you know, storage caches of, uh, of emmer inside them and, and things like that. Um, the um, sheep and goat and cattle seem to be actively managed by the inhabitants of the site. So they're not just getting the meat there. They're actually probably controlling their herds. So that's an important part of the economy. Um, in terms of craft production, one of the main things is the ceramic um, production of these ceramic jars that I was telling you about. Uh, they're they're well made. Um, you know, they're 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 really well made actually. But they're uh, it's quite standardized assemblage. You know, very particular forms, and you get small variations on a theme. But what you notice about the EB four assemblage I just mentioned is how variable it is. You know, even though there's a lot less of it. I would say overall in this area, durable prestige objects are rare. And you know, some commentators, particularly Rappi Greenberg, would emphasize, emphasize that simplicity and uniformity are core elements of um, EB2 culture and, and, and some level EB3 as well, although that, I, that seems to be going away during that period. But we don't have the types of durable prestige objects we found earlier in the Chaldeolithic or perhaps even later um, in the Middle Bronze Age. I mean, for example, you have some things that here's a bone tube from Farus. Um, People think of these as uh, cosmetics holders, but you know we have one here um, from from Copa that's the same. You find two or three of these pretty much at every site. I don't know why, and just just bring it up because it's because it's quite rare. But it's a relatively insular um, economy. You know, it doesn't show these great um, great evidences for for large scale um, large scale trade networks, um, with one exception, which I'll talk about. Um, and then uh, there's no real evidence for a market economy as we understand it. Now you can argue this point with me, um, and I'm sure many will. But my argument is that we don't really see any evidence for it. And you know, we really shouldn't assume it exists um, because we don't have any sort of uh, evidence for value equivalencies or that kind of exchange that would go along with that like you do in other parts of the Near East at this time. Contact with Egypt is important to mention because much has been made out of it and it warrants its, um, its own slide. So just to talk about the pottery as promised, um, it may seem boring, but I have to say that ceramics are a major part of the surviving archeological record. Um, and in this case, I, I cannot stress their importance enough. I mean, they are really the hardware of these uh, early states to, I suppose, coin a phrase that from, from Graham Phillip really, um, or repeat a phrase that Graham Phillip has coined. Um, they are, when, you, when you're doing, you know, mostly a liquid economy of olive oil and, and wine, I mean, they're critical to the maintenance of their, that production and the storage and movement of these liquid products. And many have argued um, that they carry a clearly um, identifiable Brand. So they're a bit like the wine bottles of their day. Like you know what you're looking at when you see it. And it's because of this, um, this particular um, combing uh, pattern. Thus, you know, we can use them to gain a bit more nuance about aspects of these early states. Um, they come in sort of um, two stripes. There's this um, shale-based, quote unquote, metallic wear, and then a move later on to a local um, wear. All of them, they're always plain or burnished or combed or some combination of the three, but the combing becomes more common bit later. And this is sort of the core area of their distribution, I would say, though they're found um, you know, up and down the coast, um, as it, I showed you in the picture earlier. They're mostly specific types. You've already seen the jars that are presumably used to store and transport liquid commodities. But in the EB2, for example, <clears throat> in Lebanon, you get these platter bowls. Um, they're quite large. Um, you know, they, they continue on in the EB3 in Palestine. They can be 80 centimeters or something. And many have used these um, as uh, evidence or understood them as evidence for large scale you know, kind of feasting or communal meals. Um, however, they drop out of the repertoire um, after the EB2. And they're mostly made out of this uh, kind of this kind of shale uh, pottery. So to talk about that, um, you know, during the EB2 broadly, all of the pottery at Arca and most of the pottery we see in other places, um, save cooking pots, is defined by this very strange clay that's made of this, um, this shale pottery. And it comes in two stripes, really. Um, you know, you have this kind of plainware and this sort of silty stuff with a lot of very finely ground quartz. And this is the really special fabric. You know, all the really nice jars are generally found in this in their Lebanese context. Now, um, the sources of this shale are not found near major areas of settlement on the coast, generally. I mean, south of Beirut, maybe a little bit, but where they are found is mostly um, quite high in the mountains. So we have to explain, how does this shale get everywhere, you know, around 3050 BC, maybe a little bit later, 
across the Levant, you know, more or less. Well, not across, but across the northern, uh, across the central and the southern Levant. Um, so we've posited that perhaps itinerant potters are playing a role. And Graham and I have argued this in a recent paper. And I think I also read that Pierre de Miroshevji put forth this idea. Um, what we would show here, you know, we've done a lot of chemical analyses on this pottery. Uh, from around here, you can see from the Bekaa Valley, from the Jordan Valley, um, Lebanese coast, Northern Jordan. And this silty shale stuff that I just showed you really seems to form a quite a tight chemical grouping. So we're not implying that they're all made at one place, but it seems like they're targeting similar sources and that there are probably very closely linked communities of practice that perhaps are bringing this material down in baskets, potting it on the coast, where they need to, they're mixing it with local, uh, more calcareous sources. We have evidence of, of that as well. Um, but it's one of the ways, not necessarily the only mode, but a way in which we sort of explain or, or how this stuff just gets everywhere all at once. So during the EB2, uh, the repertoire changes slightly, and there's a move towards calcareous fabrics on the coast, coast and the shale fabrics pretty much disappear. I mean, there's one or two exceptions where they're used. Um, but the combing becomes really popular and it actually becomes associated in its way um, with the Northern Lebanese um, coast um, or a very particular brand of, of jar. It also coincides with the major building phases of the EB3. So, um, and the same exact fabric is used uh, on comb vessels from Biblos to Arca and even further south, it's quite linked. And they're very difficult to distinguish under the microscope, but we can distinguish them um, chemically. So there's evidence of, you know, kind of centralized production. Um, and there's evidence that there's a kind of what we call a local capture of ceramic production. However, this doesn't seem to be located um, at the sites um, in this part of the part of the, the Lebanese coast. Um, we have, you know, Levant wide, there's very limited evidence for pottery production um, taking place at sites. Uh, whereas in later periods, you, you do tend to, uh, to see it. So ceramics become uh, more and more important to the political economy is what we argue. And we can see that because their, their numbers increase. Um, and with the greater demand, we argue that there's a need to maintain local specialists and ensure supply so they can keep things ticking and they move towards um, a more localized form of production. And just to show you here, more chemical data, but there's a big chemical grouping of samples from the Biblos region. So Biblos, uh, Fadaus, Tel Farabida, and it shows that they're interacting and they're, they're trading jars, they're getting them from the same places, they're moving them about back and forth um, quite a lot. So it represents a highly integrated economy. Um, here, you know, we don't get much overlap with the archaeo material. So presumably, there's not much communication in terms of ceramic jars anyway, or the, the, the materials they contain between these two places. Um, however, um, why would they? You know, they're, they're materials that are abundant locally and, and except for exceptional cases, they wouldn't really need to, uh, to trade that. But, um, and then we should talk about a little bit international relationships, because as I said, the evidence is quite slim on the ground for that. Um, <clears throat> but much has been made of the contact with Egypt. And in fact, we're working on a paper, uh, myself and Karen Sawada and, um, and others are working on a paper about this very topic. And um, I should just show you, you notice this sort of core of Giza jars. Unfortunately, I won't have a chance to talk about it in detail, but it represents, um, even though it might be hard to see from this, a very specialist production um, in the area of Biblos made for the, um, the Egyptian um, market, um, you know, or the Egypt an Egyptian audience, let's say. <clears throat> so there's very little material evidence compared to other periods, I would argue, and it's mostly at Biblos. Okay, we have one or two things at other sites, but mostly at Biblos. Um, and, you know, we're dealing with I mean, if you really take a part of the data, there are about 25 stone vessels. And recent work again by Michelle has pointed out there are 40, um, 40 of these flint knives, which are really characteristic, you know, these kinds of things. And you can see how they're being used. You know, they're sort of um, generally, I mean, both of these ty types of materials are generally used in ritual or elite contexts. I mean, you can't say that 100%, there needs to be a bit more nuance, but mostly that's what they're used for. And you can see here this, um, this tomb uh, for you showing a, a ritual slaughter of this cow using one of these knives. So a lot of the finds also, especially the stone bowls, are associated with the, the main temple, the Balak Gebel temple and the so-called sacred enclosure. So you don't see them at other temples, mainly those, um, those two, and same for the knives. However, the knives, I, I suppose, occur more uh, frequently across the site. But what it shows is that there is a consistent exchange, mostly focused on the later periods. I mean, earlier on, the Egyptians seem to be 
focusing you know, on the Levantine coast in general, early Bronze Age II, but there's a shift in early Bronze Age III further north. And we would argue that this evidence shows that ritual is at the heart of, of the exchange and perhaps it's mediated through the temple. Um, the Egyptians get all kinds of things, you know, wood, um, resins, um, and they get these comeware jars full of, know, full of presumably wine or, or oil or something they use in their rituals and their burial practices. And in fact, there's evidence that the jars themselves are, are almost uh, seen as a high status commodity and are, are reused even after they've been emptied. But it's not clear what they're giving in return. I mean, they're obviously um, doing some sort of ritual performance um, in, a, in, in a place like Biblos, but it's unclear what they're exchanging. What do the people at Biblos get? And whatever they get, it's not filtering down to the rest of uh, society. That seems to be clear. So um, putting together the pieces, I've subjected you probably to enough um, by now. Um, the sudden adoption of, to summarize these points, the sudden adoption of elements of new urban package uh, occur around 3050 BC on, you know, mostly previously occupied sites, though there seems to be no clear um, development um, between the two. Um, the sites in Lebanon are quite small, and the main phase of building only occurs after 2900 BC and with serious rebuilding uh, after about 2800 or, or 2700. Um, this occurs mostly in the Biblos area, just to say, um, you know, Arca is a different different story, and may, Sidon maybe as well. Um, we have planned settlements, and I think it's fair to say that ritual or elite contacts dominate sites. I mean, you know, thinking about Farus, we may find some low-income housing next to the port or something, but I, but I highly doubt that's going to um, materialize. <clears throat> there is a great increase um, in pottery production throughout the early Bronze Age two and three, but mainly in the EB three, uh, to facilitate olive oil and wine production. And there's an evidence that this is being um, managed more intensely by locally um, as the EB three carries on. I mean, it's in fact this great increase in pottery and its abundance that allows us to clearly identify these sites, perhaps makes it quite difficult to identify the earlier um, EB1 calco sites. Um, so we have some evidence that you know, of administrative uh, activity. So the sites may be mediating production in some way, though it's not located um, at the, at the, the, fo the locus of the production is not necessarily at the site um, in terms of craft production. Of course, agricultural production is located there and they may be mediating redistribution. There's little evidence for high status objects and external trade is limited to a few key sites um, centered around the temple, um, especially uh, you know, during the EB3. And then in the EB4, there's a great decline or is the perception of decline in these spaces. Um, and at the very least, we can see a drastic economic um, shift. So if we put together this data and then start to rethink you know, the coastal EV sediment landscape in, in the, um, during this time. What can we say? So how do we explain the rapid adoption of this way of life? Um, you know, we don't see really any evidence for long-term economic development, but I mean, we really need to think about how we, how we explain why it appears so suddenly. And given the size of these cities, you know, and, you know, clear focus on temples at places like Biblos and a lack of evidence for, you know, markets or market exchange, um, should we rethink economic activity as perhaps underpinning ritual performance, communal activities, feasting, and festivals? I mean, should we rethink these sites? I mean, we've gotten stuck as thinking of them as cities, but should we perhaps think of them more as temple complexes? Um, or in perhaps like a modern analogy, or you know, sort of medieval analogy would be more like monasteries. You know, there are places of ritual activity. I know it's not a one-to-one, -one, but there are places of ritual activity with a kind of side hustle and economic activity. Um, uh, however, again, it's not a one-to-one -one there. Um, you know, the sites or whatever administrative component there is there, which remains nebulous, is responsible for collective activity and gatherings. And with time, the institution perhaps of the temple could take on a more organizational or administrative role, you know, coordinating building projects, stockpiling supplies in the events of a crisis. You know, obviously if a war came along, you know, why do they need to use their big fancy fortifications? but there needs to be something there in case of a food shortage or something like that. So perhaps we can start to envisage this as a, a subset, not necessarily completely um, a new, but a, but a sort of mentality that stems out of the ritual economy that's carried over from the Calcolithic, but one that is more grounded in the practicalities of daily life. I mean, it rejects devotion by symbolic deposition 
of hard to obtain objects. So you don't spend so much time getting a bunch of stuff that you're, you just want to show off by throwing away, which is, <laughs> which is quite wasteful and isn't, isn't really practical. Here, I mean, what you have is, you know, a lot of work that goes into um, um, activity that then is, you know, basically people eat and feast. And so there's some um, greater communal um, benefit to that. The key thing is that we need to understand that there are various pathways and manifestations to complexity across the Near East, but even within subregions. And while they seem to be linked by infrastructure, I think the underlying social concepts that um, dictate their adoption and their progression, um, you know, have to be taken on a sort of region by region basis or case by case basis. <clears throat> Couple of key questions just to wrap up. Where are the rest of the people? I mean, I don't think we can really say that uh, the demographics works out here. So the, clearly there's a population that we're missing. Um, how well integrated are they with, um, with fortified um, settlements? Um, oh, how well integrated are these people with fortified settlements? Uh, to what degree uh, do the settlements control the surrounding landscape, surrounding landscape you know, um, and how uh, much do they control the mountainous regions? What's the interplay there? I mean, these areas have largely not been surveyed, so there, there are a lot of sites um, to go. I will say within the region of Farus, Biblos, um, it, this, this area on the coast has been well, well surveyed, so you know, we don't expect any surprises or huge sites there. We don't know what's going on in the mountains. Um, how do the upland regions um, factor in is the question. And to wrap up, just some acknowledgements to the DGA for the re relevant study of the material, um, the Crane Project for funding a lot of this, and um, you know, thanks to all these people for their various bits of support and fruitful discussions, especially those who, who worked at Kubo. I mean, all of this is a product of um, uh, many, many chats with them, though I take responsibility for the, um, the interpretation. So you, know, you can direct your, your angry comments at, at me. All right, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Kamal. Um, can I just remind people uh, to put questions in the question and answer box that it, it appears in the uh, menu bar at the bottom. It just says Q&A. And I can then pick up on the questions and, and uh, pass them over to Kamal. But just to kick things off, I mean, it does strike me as a, it is a very Lebanese situation that you have an almost inexplicable economy that comes out of nowhere and that is, is actually, you know, um, potentially short-lived and unstable and hard to explain. Mm -hmm. um, having excavated one of those large late fourth millennium sites myself at Tel Ashuna in the Jordan Valley, the idea that there's an area of the Levant where there is no equivalent to that, the kind of slow build up towards urbanism is really, really quite striking. H have you any thoughts come out of what the later fourth millennium might look like? Or why no, we're not I mean, finding? I mean, you know, we've, you know, we've discussed this quite a lot, you know, and, and, and I think the problem is, is we don't really know. I mean, look, we have Sidon Dakraman, which looks like, you know, with these, with these sort of circular absidal structures, those occur at Biblos as well. And we know that that sort of lines up with the EB1A in Palestine, you know, no problem, but the later, I mean, it's tough. There's evidence from Biblos, you know, I, I'll let somebody else discuss it. I mean, I think, but, but there's no, my understanding is that, you know, if we don't have significant settlements where there's a mounded buildup, and if people aren't using pottery that often, you know, if, if pottery is deployed, as you know, you and I have argued in a recent paper for very specific purposes, we may miss it in the landscape. You know, it might be really hard. So Jenny Bradbury in a recent, you know, she, I mean, she's, they, they, these people are like heroes of socialists. Like, I mean, like, like the surveying on the Lebanese coast is almost impossible. It's so dense that we just don't have any idea. I mean, I'm sure there were people there, but I think they're perhaps um, in much lower density settlement that creeps, you know, and that, that we are just missing the settlements because we don't know. I mean, if there's no pottery, how will we know? How will we know? Do we have the, um, the lithics well-defined enough to identify calculated settlements? So to answer your question, I have no idea. You know, honestly, I have no idea. Good. What do you, what do you think? Well, it's not my job to think. No, you're today. just a discussion, you know, it's like, uh, I have no idea. I mean, yeah. but what I will do is I'll pass on um, uh, two or three of the questions people have put. Uh, any carpet carrot wear from Sam Wolf? Oh, uh, no, I think there was one shirt. Uh, uh, maybe there's a shirt from Kuba. Is that, is that right? I, I think, think there was one possible shirt. One shirt from Kuba. It's very limited. And I think one shirt was... Uh, was um, found in the Bekaa, one or two. I, I've, I've seen that, but um, no, they, they seem to completely skip over this uh, this area. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, I guess the EB3 is um, is a is a 
pretty intensive. I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, look, the sites are quite quite well built up at that time. So perhaps they had some control. And it's an interesting point. They could at least, um, I don't know if the uh, Herbert Kirak isn't really an invasion, but they could at least block or at least stop people from settling there if they wanted to. But maybe that's an unfair characterization. So, so no. And another question um, for this one from Rafi Greenberg, who's asking about the, the concept of itinerant potters producing the shale wares. Rafi's arguing that, uh, asking if these things need to be, the, these vessels need to be fired at 850 degrees centigrade. How does that work with itinerant potters? Well, I would think that, so a couple of points um, that we, we should make here. We're running through a phase of experimental potting now. And one of the things that's come up is I've made test cones of all of the different fabrics that I've, that I've found in Lebanon. And in fact, the calcareous wares, if you fire them over anywhere near 800 degrees, they just crumble. So the nice thing about the shale wares, Rafi has pointed out, um, is that they have to be fired at high temperatures. But I don't necessarily think the potters need to bring the fuel down. Um, I can see um, that they're, in a way, part-time specialists, seasonally operating, perhaps between the mountains and the coast. And in fact, part of the deal may be uh, that the fuel is provided for you by the settlement. And in fact, you know, um, we're engaged in a project now called Fueling the State, where we're looking at the viability of um, various different types of biofuel. And it seems like there is definitely a symbiotic relationship between um, the use of olive products, the pressings and things, as a fuel. So in fact, if the potters showed up, you know, the olive, olive waste is a, is, a, is a massive environmental problem. I mean, if they show up and they, they're happy to burn away your clippings and happy to burn away the, um, uh, the, the olive waste, you know, that could be an explanation. They're simply just bringing the clay down with them uh, in powdered form, which I, got, I have to say, you know, our, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say that this is absolutely the way it's being done, but it seems more logical to bring the clay down than, than the finished pots, you know? So I don't know. I mean, it seems like it would be a bit more of a bath anyway. Um, and the kilns are just built, you know, next to the sites, and this just can be done, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from uh, Martin Hetherington about um, asking about the likelihood that part of the population were actually living in wooden buildings. Yeah, and that's a that's an interesting point. I mean, so the short answer is we don't know, but I mean, further than my comments earlier, I mean, you know, we, you know, pottery. If we don't have pottery. I mean, I think we'll struggle to find these sites. And in fact, it makes perfect sense that you know, wood and wood products were being used by the majority of the population for basketry and all kinds of things. Um, and, and if they're living in wooden houses, you know, how would we know? We don't, as Near Eastern archeologists, I would argue we almost don't have the tools to excavate sites like that. We just don't, we just don't, don't really do it. You know? And it's, um, so if that's the case, then we'll be missing a large segment of the population. And I, for, unfortunately, I don't know the answer how we rectify this. You know, I leave that to my colleagues my heroic colleagues running their landscape surveys, you know, how we actually find the site. LIDAR, I suppose, is this new? Mm -hmm. Yeah, croc marks, that kind of thing, yeah. yeah. And Joanna Shahoud's asking about the botanical record, the botanical evidence from Cuba. Oh, uh, yes, um, she works on our bones. Is that right? <laughs> anyway, yes, yes, yes. Uh, we don't, so we've only, um, so it's being studied at the AEB currently. Um, we've had a preliminary study done um, by uh, Jade, sorry, I forget her um, last name, Graham. Um, it slipped my mind temporarily. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry Jade. Yeah. But she did, she did, a, um, she did a, 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 a study on this, and it, it tends to sort of show what's, you know, it, it sort of reinforces what's known at Farouz. A lot of olive, um, some grape, um, and then um, likewise, you know, in her own report, you know, from the, you know, we understood the movement of the animals are being, um, uh, managed by the by the site. So um, similar to Fadus, I would say, is the preliminary indication. But hopefully we'll know something more in the coming bit. Yeah. And Camilla Sala is asking about the flint knives from Biblos, asking oh, yeah. whether we know if it's local Lebanese flint or Egyptian imported material. Um, I, I have to say I'm not an expert on this, but I default to Michelle and also to Kirin Savada, who you know would immediately see this as an Egyptian production. And there's a history of it. You know, they're they're found from the EB1. There's one example of an EB1 knife at Sidon. Um, well, maybe it's EB2 actually, but found in the EB1 um, context, and then uh, also at Biblos. So there's no reason to think this was locally locally mm -hmm. made. 
Um, and they're all pressure flaked, aren't they? Which is a, yeah, I mean, a technique well, I, that's really not used much in the Levant. I mean, it's an Egyptian technique. That's right. I mean, either it's made locally by an Egyptian, which could be an interesting supposition, but um, but you no. Know, and unfortunately, I will never probably look at these materials with my own hands, you know, to be able to say. And mm -hmm. I don't know that I could tell him. And we have a, a question that's come up in the chat asking what we can say about the mortuary practices of the period. Nothing. You know, and, yeah. <laughs> and actually, I, I would I would say that um <clears throat> again, Jenny Bradbury Graham, you guys are the experts here. But I'd also default to you know I, if you read Rafi Greenberg's recent book, you know he will um you know I mean he treats this in detail, and I think you know his idea would be I shouldn't speak for him, but you know it's it's a rejection of um, previous mortuary practices, but it's almost um there's less veneration of the individual in favor of communal activity. I hope I, I have I hope I got that right, but um we, there's nothing that we know of. Mm -hmm. And uh, Marco Yamoni is asking about uh, what we can say about settlement hierarchy and this is whether we've got two or three tiered hierarchies. I don't know. I mean, Marfo found in the Bika that there were three, two, a three tiered system. Um, and then, you know, um, Jean Paul Talman would have maybe said the same, I think, for the area of Arca. However, um, you know, none of these sites have actually been excavated. So we don't know, you know, what's actually Middle Bronze Age, what's Early Bronze Age, and what the nature of the Early Bronze Age site looks like. Um, so if we just want to go off the three, three, three sites excavated in the Biblos region, um, you know, there, there's a big site, Biblos, at about five hectares and two smaller sites that are like one to two, and that's it. You know, but um, just, just to say, you know, all of the trappings of the major sites are found at the smaller ones. I mean, it is a huge wall at Fudders. I mean, six meters. I mean, they really, there's no difference in terms of the infrastructure, let's say. You know, the main difference, I would say, is that the Egyptians seem to be focusing some attention on the main um, temple, which probably brings some prestige, particularly to that temple, and there, therefore to Biblos, and that sort of, there might be a hierarchy in that sense, but anyway, I, I don't mm -hmm. know is the answer. Yeah, and uh, Mahmoud Mardini is asking about the, the role that um, clandestine excavations and the rapid urbanization of coastal Lebanon in recent decades might have had upon, through destroying a lot of the potential information. Yeah. How much impact has this had on our understanding? Yeah, so I mean, um, you know, Farous and Kobo both quite badly, um, badly damaged. Uh, and, you know, they were found by, um, you know, I mean, remember, Graham, we, we were the ones that this the local gentleman pointed out to us, we, you know, the PD3 site at Kobo was unknown. Mm. Um, and Farous, you know, is, is the same situation, you know, I actually saw it on a motorbike when I was like 24 years old, um, riding off a hangover, I think is the, is the idea. But um, you know, there are sites that have probably been raised, I suppose, but I, I mean, my sense is, is that since the progression, speaking specifically on the Biblos region, um, the progression of urbanization is quite recent. So if we look at the aerial photos in the relatively flat coastal plain, I think we would we will see most of the sites that were there. So I don't think we're going to find another five or six meter, six hectare tell. That, that I think is, um, is not going to be found anywhere near the coast, perhaps in the mountains or something. However, Mahmoud points out he is right. We may be missing a couple of um, smaller ones that have just that have just mm -hmm. gone. Um, had we not showed up, Kobo would have been completely uh, completely destroyed. We would know nothing about it. You know. Um, yeah, yeah. But it really is quite striking, even compared with Palestine or the Jordan Valley, isn't it? Just how relatively few sites there are in the, along the coastal plain and how small they are. It really does yeah. jump out at you. It's Lebanon wide, you know, and it and you know it's um the sites are tiny. You know, there are a few bigger ones, you know, in the, in the north as you go towards, um, towards, you know, Syria and the Bekaa that are, but these are, have Roman settlements. I mean, um, Herman Gens and company just found this Tel Heri, you know, which is fairly big. I mean, that's just the opposite side of where Cuba is. I slipped my mind to mention it, but, um, you know, that also has, I think, a Roman occupation, as I understand it, and definitely late Bronze Age, but some early Bronze Age material. So where you get the really big sites, they're, they're usually occupied in the Roman period, but otherwise, you know, four or five hectares. Yeah, that's it. And Hanan Sharaf is asking, she's reminding us that um, surveys in the Akka plain have produced small EB23 sites, you know, some not very far from Tel Akka itself. And she's just asking if the sites of EB23 were orientated around religion, where do these smaller settlements fit into that? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. And it's, um, I mean, I, I think that that explains their you know, explains their existence, you know, in some way. I mean, I guess what I was trying to show was like at a place like Farous, you, you have calcolithic burials, you know, and then 
I guess what I was trying to show that it had been a place that had long been, um, you know, long been the focus of ritual activity. So it would be logical that it would continue to be um, when the EB, EB2 was, was built up. Now, this is very specific to this region, you know, because I honestly, we, you know, I don't know about the sites in Yarka region. And in fact, I mean, do those sites, I mean, if there were burials there, would we necessarily see it in survey collections? Or, you know, would we have to dig a little bit more? I mean, I don't know. And, and also keep in mind, Arca is very different because it's the one that continues on. You know, mm. it's the one that's more robust. So it may have, I don't, um, I have to say, um, the sort of hierarchical settlement, um, you know, throughout the central and, su and southern Levant is, you know, there are these kind of dependencies that you can see in the archaeological record. So perhaps that exists in the region of Arca, but not necessarily um, in the region of Biblos. Mm -hmm. And we have a question from uh, Nadeshta Knudsen, who's asking whether there's evidence for uh, miniature ceramic figurines, zoomorphic figurines, uh, figurines anthropomorphic or whatever. Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, we have one from Kuba. I, you know, I, I thought about including it. Um, it's from Kuba 1, so it's an early 82. Um, I don't know what it is. I think they mostly are... Um, I just read an article about this and I was wondering what, what animal they mostly are. Is it, is it lamb? Something like that. But honestly, we don't have enough to know what it is. But yes, so there's, I know, I know one from Kuba and there are a couple scattered about. So, um, um, you know. Yeah. And Carla Masri is asking about uh, Baalbek. What, what kind of evidence is there from uh, the Bronze Age at Baalbek? Yeah, you know, I am, um, I'm not entirely sure what they've gotten up to um, in recent years, but I think. Um, and, you know, and Hanan Sharaf works actually in the area and she would know better than me. Um, however, I, uh, I, I think they have early Bronze Age there. There's definitely Middle Bronze Age um, and also all the way down to the Neolithic. So it's, um, you know, a long, long settlement, you know, there. Um, you know, so there's a lot of evidence, but I don't know what evidence they have for. So Baalbek has a tell in the middle of the temple complex, you know, that they can dig in a sounding, but it's quite difficult. So. Um, my understanding is what they're recording is mostly stratigraphy, so I don't know in terms of structures um, what they'll actually come up with um, there. But I'm not up to date on the recent excavations there, so um, you know, yeah. I, I don't know is the short answer. I mean, having worked myself at uh, Tel Mend, you know, at, at the northern end of the Bekaa Valley in the, on the Syrian side, I've always felt that the Bekaa is kind of a hole in the middle now, now that we understand much more about the coast. We know quite yeah. a lot about Palestine and Jordan and even Western Syria now, the, the, the void remaining is the Bekaa. I mean, the typical EB1 wares that you would expect, like the sort of gray burnished wear, I mean, we have those in the Bekaa in some limited quantity, you know, and I, and I saw them. I'll, I'll admit when I studied them for my thesis, I, I failed to identify them. I didn't know what they were, so I'd never seen them, you know, but um, but <clears throat> the opportunity to re-examine this material shows you that there's more connection there. And there has been historically, even in earlier periods in the Neolithic. So, I mean, in a way, you can almost see that part of the Lebanese coast, you know, though we think of Biblos as this really, really important site in Grand Settlement, actually, in its historical trajectory, it's quite an isolated part of the coast. You know, it doesn't have the connections to the Bekaa, um, like, you know, like Sidon does in, this, in the same way. And in fact, after the Middle Bronze Age, Late Bronze Age, you know, in, in the Amarna text, it's clearly a second fiddle to cite an entire. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks very much, Kamal. Um, I think that's all the questions that we have open. So I was just wondering if you've got any final thoughts or remarks you'd like, like to make, and then I'll hand it back to Carol to send us all away. <laughs> no, I think I've, I've talked enough, these poor people. Well, thank you all for coming though. I, I, it was a lot of fun for me and I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, uh, Kamal, and thank you also, Graham, for chairing for a very uh, insightful and interesting uh, talk. I had no idea that uh, the Lebanese Bronze Age was quite so different um, to the to the rest of uh, the Levant. Speaking here from uh, being in being in Jordan, so um, I've I've visited some of the sites, but I've uh, thank you for this great insights and new information that you have given us. And thank you to everybody uh, for joining us today. We've had uh, 90 in the audience at our, our maximum uh, capacity today. So uh, who've, uh, who've mostly held through with us right through until the end. So, um, so thank you very much. I think this also says something for the new information that you've, uh, that you've given us as well. So, um, we hope everyone has enjoyed the event. Um, 
We, as CBRL, um, run a number of events, um, everything um, from mandate history all the way through to we've had things on the impact of COVID and um, uh, we're planning uh, two more events. I think we've just announced one today about um, uh, geoscience and archaeology and its impact on sustainable agendas. So please do look at our our website, sign up for our newsletters if you haven't already to look for what we have coming in March and in future months. Um, and thank you again and stay safe and well from a wet and windy night in Jordan. Good night. <laughs>